for the lost. So that if I were to say to you that I was going to preach to you the gospel, you would expect me to focus on the message of God's amazing saving grace of love. And how that through our faith in Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished through his perfect life and his sin-bearing death on the cross, then all our sins may be forgiven. With the result that we will no longer be subject to God's judgment and condemnation, nor will we face an eternity in hell, but rather an eternity in heaven. And of course, it's important that the lost hear that voice, because hear that message, because without that message, they cannot be saved. However, my point here this morning is that the gospel is much, much more than just a message for the lost, in that it also has a wide range of blessings for the saved, by the means of which we may enrich our Christian lives each day. So what then might those blessings be? Well, they are blessings that flow not simply from Christ's life and death, but which also flow from his resurrection, from his ascension, from his role as our high priest, from his offering of himself to God on our behalf in the most holy place, from his ceaseless intercession from us day by day, 24-7, and from his enthronement now at God's right hand, pending that moment when he shall return in majesty and glory and finally usher in a new heaven and a new earth. These are also a vast range of blessings that flow from the good news of what it is that God has done for us. Blessings that should help us as Christians live our lives effectively to God's glory. So what I want to try and do this morning is to endeavour as best I can to make sure that we are enjoying this full range of the benefits of the gospel that the gospel has for us. So what I want to try and do, as I say, is to broaden our view of what the gospel is, so that we see it not simply in terms as being a message for the lost, but also as a message for the found as well. And our starting point for that is going to be that very term, gospel. What does the word itself mean? Well, the word gospel itself simply means good news. That, that's, that's what it means. The word gospel is actually an ancient Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Saxon term. That means it's pre-Norman, pre-1066 and all that. And it was used by the Saxons in their translation of the Latin scriptures to translate the Latin, Latin word evangelium, which meant good news. So, for example, in Matthew 4 and verse 23, uh, in the Latin version, it said how that Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. And the Latin version said he was proclaiming the evangelium of the kingdom. And the Saxons translated that as the gospel of the kingdom, because the term gospel and evangelium meant the same thing, simply good news. The kingdom was good news. That's what Jesus proclaimed. And it was that message, the message of the kingdom and the good news of the kingdom, that dominated Jesus' own ministry. It certainly dominates the Gospels when you read Matthew, Mark and Luke in particular. You'll find there the message of the kingdom comes first. And that message centred on the imminent revelation of God's long-awaited reign amongst his people. This was something that the Jews had been waiting for for some 600 years or so. Indeed, ever since the time of the prophet Isaiah. For it was he who had sown seeds of hope through a series of prophecies or words from God. Words by which God promised brighter days for the Jewish nation. And he promised those days despite the fact that the nation at that time was playing fast and loose with God himself and often triggering his judgment. And so God promised them better days, brighter days, greater things. And an example of one of Isaiah's prophecies is found in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, where we have these familiar words. He said to them, Unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Prince of Peace. 
and of the greatness of his government and priests there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forevermore. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. God promised them a king and a kingdom that would come, ushering in a whole new age. The king would be truly special, for he would set in motion what we might refer to as the ultimate great reset. Isaiah 11, verses 1 to 5, Isaiah went on to say, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. It looked as if the monarchy had been cut down, there was nothing left, but God said, No, look, there is a shoot coming. And from his roots a branch will bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. And you cannot help but already see the figure of Jesus there. He is prophesied in these words of Isaiah. And the spirit of counsel and of might and the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord is what he would go forward in. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The Great Reset was what was being promised by Isaiah, a change that would be universal in its impact and effect. And it wasn't only uh, society itself which would experience a deep clean and transformation. The coming of the kingdom would usher in a whole new realm of nature. Nature would become entirely benign. It would be transformed in a way never seen before. Isaiah 11, 6 to 9. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play with the cobra's den, and the young child will put his hand in the viper's nest. They will neither harm, they will neither harm nor destroy uh, on my, all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This was what was envisaged by Isaiah. This was where God was going with his grand story of his great kingdom. Planet earth itself would be transformed. And these promises of transformation were intended to inspire the nation so that it might put its entire trust in God. Sadly, as we know the story, the nation continued in its own way, ignoring what God himself had said, thus stumbling on from one self-inflicted calamity to another. And yet, despite that fact, we still find God continuing to utter words of comfort and reassurance, as, for example, in the prophecy of Isaiah 40 and verse 1, God says to his people, despite all that was happening to them, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received the Lord's, from the Lord's hand for all her sins. A voice of one calling. And whose voice do we finally hear? This is John the Baptist before the coming of Jesus. In the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become plain, the rugged places are plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all the people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This will, he said, come to pass. And it was from these then and other prophecies. Sorry, one of the prophecies, verse 9. You who bring good news to Zion, go up to, high, to the high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid, and say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. Here is your God. And that phrase there, uh, you who bring good news, is the first time the term gospel is used in the Bible, in the Old Testament. The good news of the reign of God. Here is your God. Look to him, trust him with all your hearts. And so it was that from these and other prophecies that an expectation gradually grew within the nation that they should be looking for a figure whose appearance on the scene would transform the nation, nation's fortunes, a warrior king, the Christ. Christ.
who would prove himself to be a mighty conqueror and who would usher in a kingdom that would dwarf all the other kingdoms on the earth. A kingdom that would provide unparalleled security because all their enemies would be subdued and a peace would prevail. A peace that would transform every aspect of human society. In the light of Leviticus, all debts would be cancelled, all poverty eliminated, there would be no more injustice, no more oppression, indeed all sickness would end and finally death itself would be dispelled, it would be there no longer. This was the good news of the kingdom that was to be proclaimed. This for Israel was their gospel. This was their hope. This was their expectation. And they longed for that day when, as the prophet Micah put it, every man will sit under his own vine and under his own fig tree and no one will make them afraid. It was whatever. It was just perfect peace that they would enjoy. And for them, this expectation would be... Um, and for them, this expectation was to realise itself not in some heavenly scene, It's not that the whole nation is thinking of going off to heaven. No, this was here on planet Earth. Whole transformed creation. This ultimately would be what Isaiah spoke of in Isaiah 65 verse 17. The new heavens and the new earth. That was the promise that was entailed within the kingdom. And at its heart then would be God. Who would be worshipped and adored. This was the good news. This was the transforming gospel. And of course it was this gospel, this good news of the kingdom, that lay at the heart of Jesus' own ministry, as seen in the reading we just had, where Jesus quoted from Isaiah 61. With that quotation from Isaiah 61, Jesus is setting out his stall as to what his ministry is going to be all about, what it is that he is seeking to accomplish. He says, I am the one whom God has sent. I am the Lord's anointed. I am the one who will fulfill what Isaiah had spoken so long ago. And Jesus' claim, of course, um, caught his listeners by surprise. I mean, look, just imagine it for a moment. Imagine that you were there. Jesus has turned up at the synagogue. Congregation is there in front of him. Those people in that congregation have known Jesus for some 25 to 30 years. He's lived in the village amongst them. He was the village carpenter. And to be honest, as far as they could recall, throughout all that time, Jesus had never said a word that would expect them, that would lead them to expect that he was something out of the ordinary. He was just the village carpenter. They didn't expect much more. And whilst, yes, of late it seemed he had been missing from his workshop, which was a bit of an inconvenience, rumour had it that he had actually gone out, round and about, and was preaching in the synagogues. And that through that preaching he had made a considerable impression on folk. There was, it seemed, something special, actually, about Jesus, which they hadn't spotted before. Because to them he was just the village carpenter. But now he's appeared back home in their own synagogue, turns up on the Sabbath day as as war was his wont. So this should be the moment that should clarify everything as far as they're concerned. And Jesus opens up on Isaiah 61, a passage of prophecy that once again promised radical change in the state and nation of the society. And, the society. and as they listened to that, their hearts would have beat, would have beat faster and they had to, imagine, had to confess that as they listened to Jesus' accompanying commentary, because he says he sat down. Now, when I sit down, you know I finish. And you go, whoa, great. He, he just, when Jesus sat down, that was not a sign he'd finished. That was a sign he was about to preach. That was the way they did things then. So Jesus sits down, so they're expecting him to preach, which he does. And what he has to say amazes them. It was undeniably inspiring. And... However, the fact that he had also claimed to be the fulfiller of this prophecy caused them a fair degree of consternation. That he was the Lord's anointed, the Lord has sent him, but he's the carpenter. Full stop. And for them, there in that congregation in Nazareth, what Jesus claimed there was a step too far. Because as far as they were concerned, There was no way that the local village chippy could be the Lord's Messiah. 
He didn't fit the bill, it seemed, in any way. And interestingly, of course, and this is an aside, John the Baptist also had a sense of reservation over whether Jesus fitted the bill. Because we read elsewhere, for example, in uh, Luke chapter 7 and verse 19, John the Baptist is suffering and he sends a couple of his disciples to Jesus just to ascertain exactly who he is. He says, this is the question, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? What is Jesus' reply? Go back and report to John that you have seen what you have seen and heard. So what was it they saw and heard? The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. This is the message of the kingdom. This is what the kingdom was intended to bring to pass. Jesus says, that's the proof that I am the Christ, the Messiah. Tell John that. Reassure him. The kingdom is on its way. The kingdom is due to be revealed. He was to preach the gospel to the poor. Or the good news is preached to the poor. Now when it says he preached the gospel to the poor, we should not think that it say that Jesus preached about his coming death and resurrection because that was not the center of his message. Because if he had preached that, most people would not have understood it. You remember when um, Jesus said to, um, to Peter that, he was, that Jesus was going to suffer, Peter says, no way, that's not going to happen. That, that can't be true, that, that isn't part of the story, that's not part of the message. And it's the same here. Jesus doesn't preach about his suffering, he preaches about the kingdom and what God was going to usher in. He focuses on the radical transformation that lay at the heart of the good news of the coming kingdom. Of course, what was more was that he could give them a taste of what that transformation would be like. He himself starts to change lives radically, at the physical level, but also at a, at a community level, you could say. Everything is changed, turned around. Miracles are performed, and those on the periphery of society are brought to his heart. Everything is turned upon its head. However, those in Nazareth on that day were unable to reconcile the fact that their local chippy was now claiming to be the Lord's anointed. The final straw came when, if you read on in the story in Luke 4, was that he made favourable comments about the salvation of Gentiles. This, as far as they were concerned, was never going to happen. And because of that, they threw Jesus out and threatened to kill him. No doubt, as, he, as you reflect upon it, in fact, no doubt, many of them would have felt vindicated in their views. Because three years later, Jesus was crucified. An event that for them clearly rendered null and void his claims to be the Lord's anointed. Because it was utterly inconceivable that the Lord's anointed would be humiliated like that. What's the point of having a warrior king if he's killed by the opposition? Serves no purpose whatsoever. He cannot be the Christ. And so those in Nazareth must have felt vindicated. Jesus clearly was mistaken. Sad, but, but true. And yet, of course, it is Jesus' ignominious death upon the cross that proved beyond all doubt that he was, in fact, the Christ. So why was it that the Jews failed to spot the Christ when he was right there in their midst? Well, that's all down to another prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 was one of the most challenging prophecies that Isaiah had to offer. For in it is graphically portrayed a humiliated Christ whose violent death would be the means by which God would satisfy the requirements of his own justice with reference to our sin. Now, to the Jews, the suffering depicted in that prophecy was irreconcilable with their expectation of a triumphant messianic king. And so the prophecy was airbrushed out and its subsequent omission left the nation without an interpretive key as to what it was that God was doing with reference to his son, whose life and death would actually be central to the fulfillment of God's grand kingdom plan. Now that plan really got underway with Jesus' own birth. A birth which, as you may recall, was heralded in terms of being good news. Good news. The good news was beginning 
to unfold. You may remember the announcement that the angels made to the shepherds in the fields. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news because uh, that will cause great joy for all the people. For today in the town of David, a saviour has been born. He is the Messiah, the Lord. The gospel good news was finally beginning to flower in all its full moan, in all its fullness. The long-awaited moment had finally arrived. And yet, despite that fact, the moment actually passes almost totally unnoticed. And why was that? I mean, was it poor PR on the part of God? Well, no. In fact, it was the very opposite, because God knew all too well that the nation's notion of the Messiah was dangerously misguided and that they did not want a dead one. And yet, as we have seen, that would prove to be the absolute key to the fulfilment of God's own grand kingdom plan. So why was Jesus' death so central? Well, because that would be the means by which God would achieve the total eradication in the end of the fatal and deadly effects of sin. If sin remains at all, there will be no kingdom. There will be no perfection. Sin had to be ultimately, in the end, totally eradicated. Because what sin does is it disfigures and defaces and spoils and mars the whole of God's creation. Everything is affected by sin. So what is that sin? Well, sin is that inherent inclination that we as humans have, which makes us prone to act in a way that is contrary to what God himself requires of us. Now, initially that might not seem like too much of a problem, until you learn that our endless violations of God's law then renders us subject to his punishment, and that punishment takes the form of death. And that death is then manifested, you could say, at several levels. It's manifested at the level of the physical. We all see death physically. It is instantly recognisable. However, it also manifests itself as another aspect another level, less obvious perhaps, and that is death as it relates to our own spirits. Our spirit is a part of what we are, and that our spirit should relate to God. That is what it's there to do, to relate to God. But unfortunately, sin has so deadened it that it is entirely unresponsive. It is indifferent. It is heedless to what God has to say. And as a consequence, of course, it leaves us oblivious of the danger we are in. We do not hear what God is saying we do not recognize our perilous condition. And that perilous condition, being that when we die, our never dying spirit will then be subject to God's eternal judgment, which is the inevitable outcome of a life lived without God. However, the good news is that we can be saved from that awful outcome. The question must be, how? Well, let me just preface that by saying that, first of all, You cannot save yourself from that dreadful outcome. Self-improvement is not the answer. Because if it was, then God need never have sent Jesus into this world. Jesus needn't have turned up if you could sort the problem out yourself. Nor should you, of course, entertain the hope that God will simply overlook your sin and say it doesn't matter. Because if that was the case, he needn't have sent his son once again. He wasted all his time and effort, all the suffering he went through. If you can get by without Jesus, then God has made a big mistake. But God hasn't. He sent his son. The problem of sin is not something that we can solve by ourselves. The solution actually lies outside of us. The solution to our sin lies with Jesus and with God. It is they who hold the key to our salvation. So what is it that they have done to save us? Well, you may be familiar with John 3.16, which kind of puts it in a nutshell. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. From which we learn that God has gifted his Son as the means of our salvation so that through our faith in him we shall not perish but have eternal life. So there is something that God has done 
He has given us his son as the means of our salvation. And there is something that we must do. We must put our entire trust in him. We must lean wholly on Jesus' name to secure our salvation because nothing else will do. Jesus alone is the one who is ideally suited to the role of being our saviour. But why is that? Because surely, since Jesus is a man... Wouldn't he also have been infected with that inherent sin that we all suffer from? Well, the answer is no, and the reason why can be traced to his unique conception. At that point, we should uh, perhaps recall the conversation that the angel Gabriel had with Mary when he tells her that she is to have bear this child. And he mentioned to her how that the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. The child that was to be conceived would be utterly unique. In that whilst on the one hand he was just like the rest of us, a human in the image of God, on the other hand he was utterly unlike us because through his conception by the Holy Spirit he was uninfected by the corrupting power of sin. And because of that he could then live a sin-free human life. The life that God the life that God intended, should then count for us. He was to be, to use the big word, vicarious. He was to be a vicarious life, that is a life lived on our behalf as our substitute. And when you look at the life of Jesus, you see the testimony of the New Testament, then you'll see that Jesus lived a perfect, sin-free life. To live that life was required, was re- faith, perfect faith, was required on his part. And that's what Jesus exercised, perfect faith and trust and confidence in God, a life submitted solely to God's will. As Jesus himself said, John 6, 38, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. We do our will. Jesus did God's will, a man who perfectly obeyed what God required. And so, as I said, God's grand plan was that that perfect, flawless, sinless life that Jesus lived should be accredited to us. And that's what happens when we put our faith in Jesus to be our saviour. God credits the blessings of his perfect life to us, which makes us wholly acceptable unto God. That's good news. And that's what should encourage us every day. The good news of what God has done for us. But what about those sins that we've committed? Won't they spoil the show? Well, yes, they would, except that God has, through his Son, dealt with all those as well. So how does that one work? Well, consider the fact that Jesus died. We must take that for granted. Well, Jesus died. But if you think about it, of course, Jesus died shouldn't have died because he never sinned. Death is the result of sin, full stop. Jesus never sinned, so he shouldn't ever have died. But he did. Why? Well, this was all part of God's grand plan, the idea being that Jesus would also deal with our sin. And this happened when God took our sin and laid it on his son and punished him instead, Isaiah 53. That was why Jesus died. He died on the cross because of your sin being laid on him by God. He suffers God's judgment on your sin so that you needn't. And that was what was happening when Jesus died upon the cross. There he perfectly fulfilled what had been so long foreshadowed in the Old Testament sacrificial system where God had decreed that a sacrifice could be offered for sin as a means of obtaining forgiveness and restoring one's relationship with God. And to achieve that end, the sinner under the old covenant would offer an animal that was without blemish or defect, and it was offered as a substitute in the sinner's place. And sentence would then be passed upon the animal, so it died as a substitute for the individual. And so it was that because the sentence had now been served, 
the sinner could be forgiven and their relationship with God restored. And that what was happening, that was what was happening when Jesus died upon the cross. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. Sentence is passed on him. He serves it for us. But that sentence was death, so he dies for us. He suffers our death there upon the cross. That was why he died. As the Apostle Paul puts it into Corinthians 5 and verse 21, God made him who had no sin, he was sinless, to be sin for us. And then pours out his judgment on him. The outcome is that by his death, Jesus served our sentence so that we needn't suffer it ourselves. So that when you put your trust in Jesus as your saviour, you do so in the confidence that God has accepted Jesus' sacrifice on your behalf. So that no further punishment is due to you because the sentence for your sin has already been fully served. So you are entirely acquitted. The slate is now wiped clean. No sin remains. Is that not good news? No sin remains. Not one. Nothing. The sin is all forgiven. And the final consequence of that is that since Jesus has, in die, has indeed died your death, you need never experience the darkness of death yourself in the separation from God that it inevitably brings. That is good news also. However, even with Jesus' life and death, the story wasn't over yet. There was still much more to be done. First thing being his resurrection now, his resurrection is absolutely key because if Jesus had simply remained in the grave, all that he had accomplished before that would not have counted. It would have been to no avail. It would have affected nothing because if death itself was to be conquered, then Jesus must come back to life to show that victory has been won. Hence, the resurrection is actually God's vindication of what his son has done. It is God's amen to Jesus' life and death. God raises him to life again. And as a result of his resurrection, what we see is a sin-free, perfect man emerging on the other side, in eternity, in heaven. And of course, when you think about Jesus' resurrection, his importance to you is that it is your, the guarantee of your resurrection also. The fact that he has been raised means that you will be raised as well because his story is now yours and you share in all that he has done. Well, that is good news as well. We know what is to come. And then following on from that, of course, there was Jesus' ascension. This too is absolutely vital because without this act, he could not then have offered his own blood in the most holy place on your behalf. It's Hebrews 9 verse 12. So what's the significance of his offering his blood? Well, once again, under the old covenant, the sinner brought a sacrifice to God. Its blood would then be offered to God upon the altar. So what's the significance of that? Well, whilst we tend to associate blood with death, in the Hebrew mind, blood was associated with life, as evidenced by Leviticus 17.11, quote, for the life of a creature is in the blood, and I've given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the, on the altar. So it is the blood, the life of the creature, that makes atonement for your life. So how did that work? Well, first of all, as I say, the animal was being, was being offered as a substitute for the individual. It suffered the consequence of the man's sin. It died. That was just part one. Part two was the offering of the blood to God upon the altar. This blood, um, by the offering of this blood, what the man was doing was offering the life of the animal to God as a substitute for his own. What was the nature of the life that was offered to God? That life, the life of the animal, it had to be without blemish or defect. That was the requirement of the Old Testament sacrifice. The basis was that God would accept that blemish-free life to count for the individual. It be as a substitution for his. 
As a result of the offering, that meant the man could leave totally forgiven and perfected in the sight of God, the relationship restored. The trouble was, of course, that the individual would then go and commit another sin and have to repeat the whole procedure once again, ad infinitum. The bottom line was that the efficacy of the old system was only fleeting. However, when Jesus offered his own blood to God in the most holy place in heaven, it was the equivalent of his offering his own perfect life to God for you. Hebrews refers to that fact. Hebrews 9 verse 14 says he offered himself unblemished to God. He offers his life in place of yours so that his life would count for you. And of course, because that life was perfect, there was no need to repeat the effort time and time again. It was once for all. So the bottom line is that both Jesus' life and death are actually vicarious. Both of them are for us. They are both substitutionary in effect. And when combined together, they secure our full and permanent acceptance by God. 24-7. There isn't a day, a moment of a day, a fraction of a second when God has a change of mind about those who put their faith in Jesus. He doesn't then say, oh, that was a really bad sin. I hadn't seen that one coming. They've all been forgiven. That isn't how God sees it at all. He sees perfect son in uh, our place. Jesus sorted everything. And his perfect presence there, the right hand of God, 24-7 24-7 provides you with perfect intercession. He's never not there. It's not that he walks out the office and, and suddenly all God sees is us. He always sees his son, perfect son, in our place. And that renders perfect intercession for us. So we are always accepted by God. And so it is that on the strength of our faith in Jesus' perfect life and death, God then declares us forgiven and accepted. And the wonderful thing is that All our sin is covered forever. It is gone. It has been dealt with. Sentence has been fully served. Everything has been done by Jesus for us. As I say, his constant presence there in heaven intercedes for us. That is good news. And you need to bear that daily in mind because that's what flows out the gospel. That's what gives you your right standing with God. When you wake up in the morning, that is where you are, accepted by God throughout the day, accepted by God. When you go to bed at night, accepted by God. He sees you through his son as accepted. There was his ascension and finally another outcome of his ascension was his enthronement. That means that right now there is a man enthroned in heaven sitting at God's right hand, sitting in anticipation of that final moment when God will give the sign that the time has come for Christ's return for the unveiling of the new heaven and the new earth and God's glorious reign, which is what all this is leading to. That's where the whole story is going. That's what God is all about. 2 Thessalonians 1.10 That will be the day when he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. And this, says Paul, includes you, because you believed our testimony. That's the key thing. This is what you have believed. This is what your story is all about, what God is doing in your life. It's all about the grand conclusion. What is the grand conclusion? Revelation 21, verse 1 to 4. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. This is what Isaiah spoke of. This is what the vision was. Because he says, the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order will have passed away in its entirety. All that causes us so much pain and suffering here will all be gone. And instead there will be created a new society and a new heaven and new earth with God at its very hearts. And we, by God's grace, will be there. And that's God's grand plan. That's where the story is going. That's what the gospel is 
all about this big, enormous picture, and you are caught up in it by God's grace and mercy. And that's the gospel we proclaim. Not just Jesus' life and death, key and essential as they are, but everything that flows from them. His ascension, his glory, his reigning, everything, his intercession, all these things are blessings that we should enjoy each and every day. They form part of our hope and expectation. So often I fear we tend to look back to the cross. The cross is key, but it was a starting point. We need to look forward. We need to look up to our enthroned Lord, man at the right hand of God, there for us, 24-7. So it is that we tell out the greatness of the Lord. And as Isaiah put it in another of his prophecies, Isaiah 52, verse 7, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. That's what the story is all about. That is where it's going. Your God reigns. And by his grace, you are his children. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the glorious gospel, for that good news so rich, the news that we can never exhaust, the news that we can enjoy. Lord, good news every day. Lord, we thank you for that. We pray, Lord, that in this dark and broken world, we may bring that good news to others. We may point to better things. Lord, help us, we pray, by your Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.